Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Today we are going to start with another system in this block. Just to remind you, we have studied the integumentary system and then we studied the skeletal system. So today we are going to start with another system that is the muscular system. And as when we studied the other systems, we started with the tissues. So we are going to start with the muscular tissue for today and then we will study the muscular system in an extensive lecture next week. Just to remind you that there are four types of tissues in the body. The epithelial tissue, the connective tissue, which we have studied most of it, including the supporting connective tissue, bone and cartilage. Today we are going to study the third type of basic tissue, which is the muscular tissue. And at the first lecture in block two, will be about the nervous tissue. That will be the fourth type of tissues. Of course, there are other types of connective tissues which we have not studied. We will study them later on. And this is the blood and lymph, which is also considered as part of connective tissue. We will study them in block three. So the main topic of today's lecture will be about histology of muscle. And there are three types of muscles in the body. There are the skeletal muscles, there are the cardiac muscle and the smooth muscle. These are present at different locations. And what is common between them is, is that they have features of muscular tissue, like for example, electrical, we will talk about this in a moment, like electrical excitability, contractility, for example. So they have these features in common with them, but they differ from each other in the place where they are located. And the, and the histology, how, how they appear under the microscope, and in the way that they are affected or stimulated by the nervous system or by the endocrine system. Like some of them are voluntary under our conscious control, others are involuntary. Histologically speaking, some of them are striated, they look as if they have alternating dark and uh, uh, light bands, others are non-striated. Some of them are cylindrical, other, uh, others are branched, for example. Location, some of them are present, uh, connect to bone, others are present in the wall of the heart. So that's how they differ from each other. But as I said, that's in common, they have the characteristics of muscular tissue. So we'll start with the skeletal muscle, and as the name indicates, the skeletal, they are attached to the skeleton. So I, they are either attached to the bone or they are attached to fascia. And some of them, as we will see next time, are attached to the skin, like in the face, and they produce the facial uh, expression. They are striated, histologically speaking. If you look at them under the microscope, there are bands, dark and uh, light, alternating bands, and we will see in a moment what causes these striations. The fibers are very long. They are cylindrical in shape, like logs of wood, and um, uh, they uh, have multiple nuclei. You can see here, multiple nuclei. The nuclei are peripherally located. If you, if you compare it, for example, with this skeletal muscle, uh, with this cardiac muscle, you will see that there is a single nucleus, and the nucleus is centrally located. But here, you can see that there are peripheral multinucleated. And um, the skeletal muscles are under our voluntary control. So the, all of them are under voluntary control, although some of them can work involuntarily, like for example, probably I mentioned that before, is the diaphragm. Like the diaphragm, which is the muscle of respiration, we have control over movement of the diaphragm to some extent, but then after that we will, like when we sleep, let's say, we don't have control of, over, over, the di the, over the diaphragm, okay? But most of them, we have voluntary control over them. The second type is the cardiac muscle, and if we go to location, location is in the heart. Please don't confuse between the cardiac muscle and smooth muscles, which are present in the walls of blood vessels. In the walls of blood vessels, we have smooth muscle fibers. We don't have cardiac muscles, are, as the name indicates, they are located in the heart. And again, they are striated like the skeletal muscle. There are alternating dark and light bands. But as I said, they have a centrally located single nucleus. They are branched and the, the, the muscle fibers, they are connected with each other 
by like discs like this. They look like jigsaw puzzle if you go to higher magnification. So uh, they are called intercalated discs. And these intercalated discs are in fact, they are site of junctional complexes, including gap junctions. Do you remember the types of junctions that we studied at the beginning? There are desmosomes, hemidesmosomes, adherence junctions, and there are gap junctions as well. So these are, many of them are gap junctions, which means that they can allow substances to pass from one cell to another because they, ha they have pores and they have gaps. So the, the muscle fibers here, they communicate with each other through these gap junctions and they con con contract like a syncytium, like a network they can contract because of the presence of these gap junctions. And these gap junctions under the light microscope you can see their location, they are located in the intercalated disc, which uh, joins two cells together. So it's located at the junction of two uh, cells together. They are under involuntary control. Um, they, they have autorhythmicity. These muscles, the cardiac muscles, they have a rhythm. They, they can contract uh, by themselves if they are viable. But the autonomic nervous system will, will control that. So the sympathetic nervous system uh, will increase the rate of contraction and the force of contraction. So as the endocrine system, like um, adrenaline, noradrenaline, they increase the same, have the same effect on them, okay? So this is to prepare the body for fight or flight. So they, while the parasympathetic nervous system reduces this rhythmicity. So it reduces the force of contraction, it reduces the rate. But they have autorhythmicity and we cannot have control over them. I mean, you cannot increase your heart rate. Smooth muscles uh, are the third type of muscle. And again, the location, they are present in the wall. We have met at least one group of these smooth muscles in the skin where they are connected to the hair, to the hair follicle and cause erection of the hair called erector pili muscle. And also they are present in the wall of hollow organs, like urinary bladder, ureter, blood vessels, gastrointestinal tract, um, the respiratory passages also, they have smooth muscle fibers. And uh, so they are present in several locations. They are non-striated. There's no alternating dark and white band. So they are non-striated and they are not cylindrical, not branched, they are spindle shaped, as you can see here. And when they contract, they will uh, uh, contract in, or twist themselves like a helix, okay? And they have a single centrally located nucleus. So that's how you differentiate between the shape, the histology of these uh, muscles. They are involuntary. But again, they have their, uh, some of them, not all of them, they have their autorhythmicity, like the ones that are present in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract, let's say, they have rhythmicity. So they contract and in order to do what we call peristalsis. So they move the contents of the gastrointestinal tract. And in some, in some, uh, at some time, they can contract rapidly. The autorhythmicity is increased by the fact that there is an parasympathetic nervous system overflow because the parasympathetic nervous system, as we will learn later on, is for rest and digest, they call it. So it will cause more contractility of these smooth muscle fibers in some of them. And at the same time, it causes relaxation of another group, which are present at the valves between, let's say, for example, stomach and the duodenum, so that the contents can move rapidly. So it depends where these muscle fibers are located it depends on how they are going to be affected by the nerve stimulus, okay? But they are involuntary and have some of them, not because the, the ones that are present in the blood vessels, for example, they don't have autorhythmicity. So these are some of the functions of the muscular tissue. Produce body movement, obviously, like the skeletal muscles, they produce body movement and they maintain body position. Sometimes the muscles when they contract, this is called tonic contraction, they don't produce movements. Like for example, now I'm standing in front of you, I'm not falling down because there are some muscles of my back and the back of my leg holding me from falling down. Otherwise, 
if it's about the center of gravity, this will call, cause me to fall down on the floor, for, forwards on the floor, okay? So but because the muscles have a tone, if I lose consciousness, if I am paralyzed, then I cannot hold myself uh, standing. And again, same, same as you, are looking, you are looking at me now with your neck is straight. After 10 minutes, you're going to sleep and your head is going to fall. So what's, going, what's, what's holding your head now in that straight position are the muscles at the back of the neck, but they are not contracting to the degree that they will cause you to look upwards. They are just have a tonic contraction. So they not only produce movements, but they maintain the body position. And they can store and move substances within the body. Obviously, that is the smooth muscle fibers that are present in the, um, also the cardiac muscle when the heart act, acts like a pump. And the smooth muscle fibers which are present in the walls of the gastrointestinal tract the, uh, and the ureter. Um, so they can move substances in walls of blood vessels and so on. And they produce heat. Okay, so that's why we warm up when at the beginning when we go to the gym, so they produce heat. They have a lot of uh, a good blood supply, very good blood supply, a lot of mitochondria that produce heat and the heat will be moved or will be transmitted by the blood to the entire body. And that's why when we, when in cold weather, we usually shiver in order, this is a shivering is an involuntary contraction of the muscle in order to produce the extra heat that is required in, in cold weather. And probably we mentioned that previously when we were dealing with the connective tissue and we said that uh, newborns, they don't, they don't shiver. That's why they have a kind of adipose tissue, which is called brown adipose tissue, which contains a good blood supply and a lot of mitochondria. So they can use it in cold weather. But as we grow up, we will lose this amount of tissue, brown adipose tissue, and we usually use this uh, shivering in order to control the temperature of the body. So these are the main functions of the skeletal, of the muscles in general. And these are the properties of muscles, the things that I mentioned previously at the beginning, that whether it's a skeletal muscle, whether it is smooth muscle, whether it's a cardiac muscle, they have things in common. So they are electrically excitable. Either there's an, a nerve ending, which releases a neurotransmitter, that uh, acts on a receptor or it's a hormone which causes their contraction. They are contractile and also to a certain extent, they can be stretched. I mean, uh, not actively stretched, uh, uh, but they can be stretched without damage to a certain extent and they are elastic. Once they contract, they can uh, stretch back or return back to their original shape. Like connective tissue, for example, um, as you will see here for, um, in the muscle, usually there is a central part of the muscle, which is called the muscle belly. And it is the, the, the meat that we eat. It uh, uh, contains good blood supply and has a lot of mitochondria and, and myoglobin. So it is red in color. But at the ends, there are tendons. These tendons are made of connective tissue, dense regular connective tissue. So they, they don't have the feature of contractility. They cannot contract. What, what happens is that the contraction, the contractility is, is done in the muscle belly and the forces are transmitted to the tendon so that the tendon just pull on the bone and cause the movement. But by itself, the tendon does not contract and it looks white again because it's connective tissue. It, it doesn't have a good blood supply. Remember, tendons, ligaments, they are dense, regular connective tissue that do not have a good blood supply. That's why it takes a very long time for the a ligament to heal after injury. The muscle itself is, however, it's, it's covered by connective tissue, like envelopes of connective tissue. We can subdivide them into three envelopes, into three sheets. So the entire muscle is covered by connective tissue that covers the whole muscle and it's called epimesium. And then the muscle itself has multiple fascicles. So these are fascicles, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And these are surrounded by each fascicle which is surrounded by perimesium. And then each of these fascicles is actually formed of muscle fibers. 
So this is a muscle fiber here. The muscle fiber itself, the muscle itself, the muscle cell itself, which we call it myofiber or muscle fiber, it is one cell and it is surrounded by, again, by connective tissue, which is called endomesium. So please differentiate between the epi, peri, and endo. We're going to have them again when we talk about a nerve. A nerve is exactly the same. It's again, the, the axons are surrounded by epineurium, perineurium, and endoneurium. So you are going to use these terms again. This is connective tissue covering. We use this connective tissue for the transmission of blood vessels and nerves to reach the muscle. But more important is that this connect, these connective tissue envelopes will be collected together at the ends of the muscle, at two ends of the muscle, to be continuous with the connective tissue that forms the tendon. So that's why the, when the muscle fiber contracts, the force is going to be transmitted into the surrounding connective tissue, and this is going to transmit it to the perimesium and epimesium, and then to the tendon. So now again, you need to be very careful when you deal with these terms. So a myofiber, which is surrounded by endomesium, is a, a cell, is a muscle cell, a skeletal muscle cell. It's a very big cell, and we will see how it's very big, because in biologically speaking, each one of these muscle fibers, each one muscle cell, was derived from one at least 100 myoblasts. So that's why it is multinucleated, and it's cylindrical, long, big cell. So we call it muscle fiber. So what you see in here, in this section, is a muscle fiber, one cell. This is one cell. And inside the cell, there are myofibrils. So this is myofibril, this is myofibril, okay? A bundle of myo, each one of them cons contains myofilaments, okay? Remember when we dealt with the uh, cell, probably this was the second lecture or the third lecture, uh, of, the, um, of this block, we said that there are microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and um, microtubules. So the microfilaments here are the myofilaments. They are actin and myosin filaments. They are protein filaments called actin and myosin. They are protein microfilaments. So you can see them here. This is a thick filament and here is a thin filament, okay? These thick and thin filaments, the myofilaments, they come together and form a myofibril. And a myofibril comes with another myofibril and another myofibril, and they form a myofiber. A myofiber with another myofiber will create a fascicle. A fascicle with another fascicle and another fascicle will create a muscle. So be careful in using these terms. They, they might look exactly the same, but there are different sizes and different magnifications we're talking about here. So from a muscle to a fascicle, to a fiber, to a fibril, to a filament, myofilament. And these myofilaments are protein filaments. So that's why we need a lot of protein. If we want to, if you want to increase the size, you have to have more of these filaments. You need to have more proteins. You eat more proteins in order to build your muscles because they are made of proteins. The thick filaments are myosin and the thin are actins. Oh, I'm always confused about that, but probably this might be helpful to you as it is helpful to me. The actin, they are two fingers to write an, uh, an A, but there are three fingers to write an M, so the myosin filaments are thicker than the actin filaments. That might be helpful. So again, the skeletal muscle, this is a, the, all of this is a muscle fiber, as I said, and it contains myofilaments and myofibrils. So it's long, cylindrical, multinucleated. You can see a nucleus here, nucleus there, a nucleus here. These are peripherally located. They are located just underneath. They are located just beneath the cell membrane. This is the cell membrane. The, the blue one is the cell membrane. 
and it is called the sarcolemma, and the cytoplasm is called the sarcoplasm. Okay, you can see multiple nuclei. The reason is that one cell originally developed from hundred blasts, myoblasts. Okay, so there are multiple nuclei here, and inside there is a pigment which is called myoglobin, like hemoglobin. It's myoglobin because it's present in the muscle, so it's myoglobin. The hemoglobin, which is present in red blood cell, has an affinity to oxygen so it is oxygen binding same thing is true here it is red and it is has oxygen binding uh, affinity so that the oxygen is readily available for the mitochondria okay to produce energy which is required for muscle contraction so that's why we have myoglobin uh, here so it, it stores the oxygen, releases it for the mitochondria. In addition to that, some other muscle fibers use another source of energy, which is glycogen. Again, glycogen is one of the inclusion bodies that are present in the cytoplasm. So glycogen is a big molecule of carbohydrate, of, of glucose, and it provides another source of ATP synthesis for the production of energy. We will see that in a moment. There are some muscles that rely more on myoglobin, so they become red in color, more red in color, let's say. And there are other muscles that rely less on myoglobin, but rely more on glycogen. So they don't look that, that red. And this is very clear in birds, like the chicken breast is white, but the thighs are red in color, because these are red muscle fibers that require more myoglobin than the white muscle fibers of the chicken breast. And here, there's a lot of energy that should be produced, so we have a lot of mitochondria. You can see here, this is a mitochondria, and this is another one, this is another one. So there are mitochondria along these uh, myofibrils. A lot of mitochondria here, again, may, a lot of them. You can see there are the sausage-shaped uh, structures with Christy inside them and matrix to produce energy. They are the, the energy uh, um, depots of the, of the cell. And in addition to that, we have another modification of the cell membrane, which is called T-tubules or transverse tubules. So this is the, the, the blue structure, as I said, is the cell membrane. But as you can see that the cell membrane is invaginated here, invaginated here. So it is invaginated in the form of tubules that surround these myofibrils. So you can see them here. This is invaginations of the cell membrane. So you can expect here that the extracellular material, the extracellular fluid can pass deep not into the cytoplasm, but can still surround the cell, but it's still outside the cytoplasm. This is how the action potential for, is transmitted. It's a very big cell, so you cannot depend on just the covering from outside. There are invaginations of the covering to the inside so that the extracellular fluid can affect the deep part of that big cell. So this is called the T-tubule system. These are invaginations of the cell membrane in order to make the action potential available all around the cell. So in addition to that, we have another modification here. We have an extensive network of endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is here called sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you go back to your lecture on the cytoplasm, you will find that there is a rough endoplasmic reticulum, which has ribosomes and is mainly concerned with protein synthesis. And in addition to that, you have smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And this is more prominent in cells that produce steroid hormones, for example. It's also useful to detoxify alcohol and other uh, toxic substances. And we mentioned that in, this, in the muscle cell, they form what we call a sarcoplasmic reticulum to act as a reservoir for calcium ions.
because during muscle contraction, you will need a gush of calcium ions, a lot of calcium ions to be present in the cytoplasm. So it will be provided by that sarcoplasmic reticulum. It stores calcium in, and, and this is required, calcium is required for muscle contraction. You can see it here. Apart from these T tubules, you can see that these yellow or orange structures, this is an extensive network of sarcoplasmic reticulum that to make the calcium available anytime. So there are the same structures that are present in every cell, but with modifications uh, that serve the function here, which is contraction. We have a lot of filaments, as we said, the thick filaments here, the myosin filaments, and the thin filaments, the actin filaments, and you can see how they are arranged. So these are the thick filaments here, and in between them are the thin filaments. Okay, So that's why in the region where you have thick filaments, it will appear dark under the microscope. Okay, But the region that have thin filaments will appear lighter in color, and that's why there are alternating bands of dark and light when you look at them under the microscope. Under the light microscope, you will not be able to see the microfilaments, but you will find bundles of them forming a dark band, while the bundles of the thin filaments here are forming the light bands. So there are thick and thin filaments, and you can see here that the thin filaments are attached to what we call the Z-disc, which is another kind of protein. So there's a Z-disc here and a Z-disc there, and in between them, this unit is called the sarcomere. Okay, between one Z-disc and the other is the sarcomere. So this is again, this is a sarcomere. What happens during muscle contraction is that these thin filaments, the actin filaments, they slide in between the thick filaments. And so one Z disc is approximated to the other and the sarcomere will become shortened. So it is not the microfilaments that are shortening. They are sliding in between each other and this results in shortening. But each filament by itself is not shortened. Okay, but it is the sarcomere is shortened. And since the sarcomere is a building block, then it will cause shortening of the entire muscle fiber. So the muscle fiber shortens, but the, the myofibr but the uh, myofibrils, they do not shorten. Okay? The, the, the filaments, the actin and myosin filaments, they do not shorten. They slide in between each other. That's why this is... Um, uh, this explanation is called the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Sliding filament. The filament does not shorten. It slides. But because it slides, then the sarcomere will become shortened. Here you can see. So if you look, for example, at this animation, you will see that the filaments, whether they are the blue ones or the red ones, they are not shortening. Uh, but they slide in between in between each other. If you look at um, in more details, you look at the thick filament. This is the thick myosin filament. It looks like uh, two uh, golf clubs in, intertwined like this, and they have heads. So these heads will approach the actin filaments and flex. As they flex, they will move the short filaments, the, the, sorry, the thin actin filaments they will move them, make them slide in between the thick filaments. And then after that, they will be released. This bending of the head of the golf club, this bending of the head of the myosin, requires calcium. So that's where we need the calcium. In order for that bending to return back to its normal position, requires energy. So that's where we need energy. So we need calcium and then energy. Calcium, energy. Calcium is provided by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and the energy is provided by the 
mitochondria. So what happens here after death, what we call it rigor mortis, is that there will be rigidity or a state of muscular rigidity after death. It starts like three to four hours after death, might continue for 24 hours, and then it will disappear. The reason for that is that after death, calcium ions are going to leak from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when they reach the calcium ions, when they reach the heads of the myosin filaments, okay, they will cause them to bend. And this will cause shortening of the muscle because the sarcomere is shortened. Because when they are bending, they are moving the actin filaments in. Okay? And then, but they cannot relax because there is no ATP. The, pay, the person is dead. Mitochondria are not working. So that's why we will have this state of rigidity, of shortening of muscle, when the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, until it's time for the lysosomes now to act, to release their digestive enzyme and start autolysis. That's about 24 hours after death. And once autolysis is started, then everything will be relaxed again. They are going to digest the protein itself. They are going to digest uh, um, the entire components of the cell. That's the reason for rigor mortis. And it will give you an idea about the mechanism of contraction of skeletal muscle. This is to show you the nerve and blood supply. It's a very good blood supply. And you can see how the blood supply reaches here. It reaches through the uh, connective tissue, the epimesium, perimesium, and endomesium, as well as the nerves. They reach through there. This is a, a, a point that we should understand here at the neuromuscular junction. The part of the nerve, we're going to study a ner nerve cell. We'll, you know that the neuron has a cell body. It has processes called uh, axons and dendrites. It's, now we are more concerned with axons. So the axon here of a nerve cell will reach the cell membrane. It expands. So this is what we call an, an end bulb like the bulb of, a, of an onion, and it has vesicles, secretory vesicles. Remember the vesicles? We mentioned about them when we studied the cell. So these secretory vesicles, they contain a neurotransmitter. The secretory vesicle reach the cell membrane of the axon, and they release the neurotransmitter, the, that chemical, which is here, it's acetylcholine. And the chemical will pass into a gap, a space, so they are not in direct contact. There is a space, and acetylcholine is going to swim in that space, in that neuromuscular junction, until it reaches the opposite membrane, which is the membrane of the, of the muscle cell. We call it motor end plate. And this membrane has receptors. Remember, receptors, the protein molecules that act as receptors in the cell membrane. And these are receptors specific for that acetylcholine. Once acetylcholine is connected here, this will result in changes in the electrical activity of the, of the cell, and what we call the action potential. I'm not going to go into action potential. This is physiology, not anatomy. But this is what happens here at the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine is released from here, uh, from the synaptic vesicles, uh, um, um, and uh, will go to the uh, gap uh, and then reaches the acetylcholine receptors and initiates a contraction of the, of the muscle. Some drugs are, uh, they, they call curare-like drugs. They are used in anesthesia, for example. Um, these drugs will block the acetylcholine receptors and cause muscle relaxation. So they use them, for example, when they open the abdomen, they need the muscles to be relaxed. But the problem is that they cause paralysis of the diaphragm at the same time. So that's why you need a respirator for that patient during the operation. Curare is a kind of poison. It's um, extracted from plants and was used by uh, South Americans. They use it on darts, for example. Usually they use blow guns and they use it for hunting. So once the, the dart hits the animal, then curare Will, will circulate in the blood and the animal will, will be paralyzed. There is a, a video here, an optional video. You can watch it, it's about three minutes, about how they hunt with the, 
with those curare uh, darts. A similar chemical might be work on, on this location, and that is, we call it botulinum toxin, which is now very famous in cosmetic procedures. It's called Botox, and they use it for Botox injections in order to paralyze muscles of facial expression, and therefore, those muscles will not have any tone and will not cause the wrinkles uh, on the skin. So the, it is used for cosmetic treatments. Uh, this one doesn't act exactly like curare, but it acts to prevent the release of local, local release of the synaptic vesicles. So there is no acetylcholine released here. So it acts in the mechanism of action is a little bit different and it acts locally. That's why they usually use it for local injections. They don't give it centrally. They use it locally. This is to show you how a skeletal muscle, I mentioned that it forms of multiple cells, hundreds of these cells. Some of these cells might not mix with the others and remain like small cells. They, have, they still have the potential to divide, but this potential is very limited. They, if the muscle is damaged, if it is not that extensive, then, they, then the muscle can be replaced by a satellite cell. But if there is an extensive damage of multiple muscle fibers, then the, there is no way that it can regenerate it should it is replaced by fibrous tissue so when we say hypertrophy of a muscle we mean that the muscle increases in size so it increases in size it increases the the microfilaments the actin and myosin filaments the mitochondria the sarcoplasmic reticulum the machinery the mechanism that is required for its contraction so it hypertrophy it increases in size but does not increase in in number when we say atrophy, we mean that it reduces in size. And this happens, for example, if there is an injury of a nerve supplying the muscle, the muscle will be paralyzed, and after a period of time, it will, be, uh, it will atrophy and reduce in size. Or if there is no nerve injury, but, for example, a patient has a fracture, let's say a fracture in the lower limb, and there is a cast surrounding uh, in order to immobilize the patient. So a long period of immobilization in a plaster cast results in atrophy of the muscles. That's why the patient after that needs to do a lot of exercises in order to increase the size of the muscle. This is to show you about regeneration. I just mentioned that the skeletal muscles have a only very limited range of regeneration, multiplication, but they can increase in size. And if there is a, an extensive damage to the skeletal muscle, it will be replaced by fibrous tissue. And fibrous tissue is non-contractile, and therefore this will reduce the efficiency of the muscle. So it, it, it's not just left like that as a gap, but it will be replaced, it will be stuffed by fibrous tissue, but this fibrous tissue here, it is functionless. And the same thing is true for cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle can hypertrophy. Like, for example, a muscle in the left ventricle, which should pump the blood against the systemic circulation, if the patient has hypertension, then the muscle needs more force in order to pump the blood against higher blood pressure. And by time, the muscle or the ventricle itself, which is reflected by hypertrophy of each single muscle fiber, will hypertrophy. As for the smooth muscles, smooth muscles can have them both. They can, they can hypertrophy and they can increase in number. So it, the uh, regeneration is possible for smooth muscle, but it is not possible or it is very limited for skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So during pregnancy, for example, you'll find that the uterus becomes so big in size and the smooth muscles on the wall of the uterus, they not only hypertrophy, increase in size, but they also undergo what we call hyperplasia. Hyperplasia means increase in number. So this happens, for example, in the uterus, the, the smooth muscle fibers in the wall of the uterus. This is what I mentioned before about variation in skeletal muscle fibers. So there are red muscle fibers, white muscle fibers. The, a, a very good example is in the, in the chicken and the meat, uh, but we don't see that clearly in, in humans. All of them, they look red. 
Uh, the red muscle fibers, they have more myoglobin, more mitochondria, and are supplied by more capillaries. The whites, they have less myoglobin, less mitochondria, and less capillaries. Functionally speaking, some of them, they require oxygen, and some of them, they require glucose. You can see here, this is a section in a skeletal muscle that has been stained for an enzyme. So it's not a usual stain. This is a histochemical stain, we call it. And you can see that there are variations in the intensity of color here because this is a white muscle fiber, this is a red muscle fiber, and this is the intermediate type. So if we, if we, uh, um, if we uh, deal with the dark ones here, you can see in those people who are running a marathon, they have more of the red muscle fibers. But in that person, uh, who requires a, a very uh, fast and intense movement for a short period of time for heavy lifting, heavy weight lifting, he, he requires more of the white muscle fibers because the slow muscle fibers, the slow oxidative fibers, they are the red ones. They use oxygen, they need myoglobin, they need a lot of capillaries, so they are red in color and they resist fatigue. While the, the fast glycolytic ones, which require more glycogen and they can uh, they are therefore they have less myoglobin they are whiter in color uh, they fatigue quickly so they can be used for uh, heavyweight lifting these are the two extremes of uh, muscle fibers and finally the last slide i would like you to take a look at it uh, and um, I'm not going to go into detail. This is for your own knowledge. There's a good video uh, related to it. Thank you.